Mr. Chairman, here we go again um, in a bipartisan tradition. We are here on a uh, budget that is little more than a messaging document for the majority party. To amplify on Senator Kane's remarks, there are actually about 40 seats in this room, and there are now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people sitting in them. There's the world's smallest press table over there with the world's most bored press corps <laughs> reporting on the world's most useless hearing. Um, and we've gotten ourselves into this pickle on our own. This budget has no hope of passing the House, which makes this year's markup especially insignificant. Tomorrow we'll be voting on meaningless deficit-neutral reserve fund amendments, uh, sort of glorified sense of the Senate statements, and then we'll have a party-line vote, and the majority will pass its resolution. It's Groundhog Day, and it's useless. Now, I strongly oppose the policies that are reflected in the majority's budget. I think they are a disaster and a disgrace, to be blunt. But I'm really concerned, as I think all of us should be in a bipartisan fashion, about how broken our budget process has become. There's virtually no chance that both chambers will agree to a common budget resolution this year. Even if they did, the budget resolution would have little force or effect. As a concurrent resolution, the congressional budget does not raise the statutory spending caps. So we'll need a separate deal on spending caps for the appropriators to do their work. The budget resolution doesn't raise the debt limit. I've spoken about the debt limit before. The debt limit is like having a bear trap in your bedroom. If you're lucky, you will not step in it. But with one stupid misstep, you're in for a hell of an injury. The budget process does nothing to neutralize that threat. Last year, Senator Perdue and I served on the Joint Select Committee on Budget and Appropriations Process Reform. We worked for nearly a year with 14 bipartisan and bicameral members on proposal to improve the congressional budget process and to give the Senate Budget Committee a more meaningful role. One idea which uh, did well in that committee is to establish an optional off-ramp in this budget committee for a bipartisan budget create a process so that if we could agree on a bipartisan budget, there's a path for it. We don't even have that. This is partisan in many respects by virtue of the rules and habits of this committee. We can fix that. Maybe we can't get a good bipartisan budget, but we damn well ought to give it a try, and we ought to have a mechanism for doing that. So I'll speak more about that when I relate uh, tomorrow when I do my <laughs> amendment to do a uh, deficit neutral reserve fund on the budget process. Um, there were congressional politics that interrupted the work of that joint select committee, but I'm working with uh, Senator Perdue and my co-sponsor, Senator Blunt, on legislation that I hope will uh, be considered by the Senate Budget Committee to explore uh, a variety of reforms, including uh, a hearing on the joint select committee's work. I want to take a minute and give a congratulation to Chairman Enzi, who in addition to being a particularly gracious and uh, kind uh, and good colleague, is also a fellow advocate for reform of the Budget Committee, and I think there are lots of ways in which we can work together to try to make this a meaningful exercise again. There is no better signal that this doesn't matter than the fact that nobody shows up for it, as Senator Kane uh, pointed out. So this markup is an exercise in political messaging, sadly, and um, we're unfortunately sending out, I think, a terrible message uh, about blowing up the national debt with $1.9 trillion in tax cuts, most of which is for very wealthy people, big corporations, and foreign investors. Thanks a bunch. And uh, now we're facing the usual talk about deficit reduction through spending cuts and through attacks on Medicare and Medicaid. The budget expressly protects billions of dollars of tax cuts for the likes of the Koch brothers while calling for $551 billion in cuts to programs for low- and middle-income Americans. This is like Robin Hood in reverse, and it's plenty of reason to oppose this particular budget. But let's set all of that aside because none of it actually matters in the long run. We can exchange our usual barbs uh, during the week ahead, but we also have the prospect of turning this committee into one that does real work. And if we're going to do that, what we're going to need to do is 
not just talk about appropriated spending, but talk about tax spending, talk about health care spending, and talk about revenues, because you don't even get to your budget arithmetically if you're not looking at those constituent parts of it. We've got to figure out what a suitable debt-to-GDP ratio looks like, a sustainable debt-to-GDP ratio. We've got to figure out how long it takes to get from where we are to there. And we've got to set some glide slopes, some alarms, some barriers to guide us on the path from the unsustainable position we're in now to a sustainable GDP to debt ratio. I suspect if we did that work, before we got to the sustainable debt to GDP ratio, markets and the world would be happy with us, because for once we'd actually be taking our role here seriously and working in the arithmetically necessary way to get to a sustainable budget. I think we can do this, Mr. Chairman. You have been a terrific ally in trying to do this, and I look forward to working with you to get this fixed. If not, we should just jettison this stupid committee. <laughs>